Hello. Welcome to this semester's final episode of The Spear. I'm Luke Johnson. And I'm Jeremy Cummings. Today we've got stories about women's tennis entering the NCAA tournament and professional wrestling. Let's get started. The San Jose State Spartans hosted the Utah State Aggies in a clash of the Mountain West Conference's top two teams. Madison Aron, Casey Watt, and the Spartans pitching staff stole the show. San Jose State returned from a six-game road trip without any jet lag. The Spartans tagged up the Utah State pitching staff for 30 hits in three games despite facing two of the best arms in the conference, April Brown and Kelly White. The pair buckled down with runners on and stranded 22 total Spartan base runners. It wasn't enough, however, as the Spartans scored five times as many runs as the visiting Aggies. It was the San Jose State pitching staff that, in fact, dominated the series. Caitlin Linford tossed complete games on, on Friday and Sunday with 15 Ks and zero walks in both wins. Linford and Colette Riggs in the Spartan offense finished with a plus 12 run differential. The Spartans' bats were led by outfielder Casey Watt and first baseman Madison Aron, who went 14 for 21 and knocked in nine runs in the series. The Spartans steal first place from Utah State in the Mountain West Conference, and if San Diego State loses and San Jose State wins on Thursday, the Spartans will clinch the Mountain West title in an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. There we go. The woes continued for San Jose State's baseball team as the Spartans got swept on their home turf by the San Diego State Aztecs, tacking on three more losses after losing the past three games. Faced, he walked in, and he hits Breen on the shoulder. 2-1 pitch in tight on the Spartan right-hander. And is back with four to play. Tanner swings. Atkinson launches one to left field. Moving back is Olivet. He'll look up, and it's gone. And for the second game in a row, Tyler Atkinson leaves this ballpark in the eighth inning. And giving the Aztecs a two-run lead for the second straight day on his, on his way to the win. Nashon, line drive, in the air to left field. Atkinson moving back, it's on the track. Atkinson bringing off the wall, it's off of him and the wall, both. Timmons scores. Right behind him, here comes Stefanke, he scores. And Tyler Atkinson, oh so close to making a catch, and may have hit his glove. But Josh Nashon, second consecutive pinch hit. Hit by a pitch on a walk. Ground ball, under the glove of Mekawa in the left field. Brown on his way around third. The throw will be cut off. Matt Brown comes in to score. And Michael Breen on senior day comes through. Run of the game, infield in, here's the bunt. Up the first baseline, fielded by Timmons, and the squeeze will score a run. Timmons will throw down to first. And the Aztecs retake the lead on a suicide squeeze play. It was a late break from third by the one, two to VC. It is tipped in the glove of Orr, and that is the ball game. This just in, pro wrestling is fake. This is a phrase people have used to devalue a product that has been globally popular for decades. But I dig deeper to hear from some of the biggest sports entertainers in the Bay Area and discover that professional wrestling is more real than people have been led to believe. All oh, wrestling's fake. <laughs> Everything we do is 110% fake. Super crazy doesn't give a fuck! People think it's fake. That's the biggest misconception. Despite captivating audiences in the tens and hundreds of thousands, wrestlers and fans alike feel there is a misunderstanding from the general public about professional wrestling. Yeah, they all, they, they're like, oh, it's pro wrestling, that's the fake stuff. But I always get bruised up and limp and uh, hit in the face and shiners and you know, bodies have been bruised. Yeah How do you learn to fall off of a 20-foot ladder? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know JR <laughs> <laughs> uh, But that's true like that's that's not gonna hurt. Yeah, that's probably the biggest misconception It's like people thinking it, uh, that it's more fake than it actually is well, they, they make most things seem like it doesn't hurt at all. Like, they don't think getting hit over the head with the chair doesn't hurt. I mean, we know that that's real. Just because uh, the matches are predetermined doesn't mean the, the hits are taken don't hurt as any less, you know? Do some people think that a chair is not really made of steel? That's what I've heard. I've heard that. 
another misconception, yeah. Same thing with the tables, all that. I've heard some crazy stuff, and the blood's fake too, somehow. A lot, a lot of misconceptions. You can understand how a wrestler would get mad if he's, you know, crapping out of a paper bag, you know, when he's 60 years old, and somebody says, oh, wrestling's fake. What, is the ring like a trampoline? No, that ring's made out of wood and metal. They put a pad under it to try to break your fall a little bit, but it's a lot harder than people give us credit for. It takes a special breed to be a professional wrestler. You go to the movie and you sit down to watch the blockbuster of the summer, the, the show stopper, the, the main attraction, the feature, that you've been, the feature presentation you've been waiting to see, the action movie that's gonna end all action movies. And you see Sylvester Stallone out there with his, with his machine gun and he's rattling them off to everybody and just laying people over like mowed lawn. You don't sit there and go, you know what, this is fake. That's Sylvester Stallone, that's not Rambo. That's a real guy, and that guy right there, that was Jackie Chan. He didn't really get shot, I know he's still alive. You suspend your belief long enough to sit down and enjoy yourself and be thoroughly entertained. That's why it was changed from pro wrestling to sports entertainment, because we're just asking you to suspend your belief long enough to be entertained. Nobody walks out the movie going, oh, that movie sucked because that explosion was so fake. Professional wrestling is so entertainment that it is in love of its own and has developed a set of linguistics to go with it. Here are some key terms in professional wrestling. Shutterstock music. A shoot can mean a lot of things, but mostly it just uh, means that there is reality involved in what's happening. It's a real thing going on as opposed to part of the performance. I, I believe a shoot is just you being tired of the bullshit and being yourself. And that's why not a lot of guys shoot, because a lot of guys don't have a backbone to shoot. A shoot is when the shit gets real, shit hits the fan. And if you, it, it's like, if you really fucking go to knock my head, uh, can I cuss? I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cuss, yeah. Okay, if you really go to shoot to knock my head off, you can guarantee I'm gonna go back and try to knock your head off as well. Yeah, you, you, you lay into me as hard as you can, I'm gonna lay right, I'm gonna shoot it right back to you. Has that ever happened to you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been rocked a couple times, but yeah. Kayfabe is, uh, it's a word that, it's really hard to translate into any other profession, but it's, it's uh, the behind the curtain, you know? It's what the magicians don't show you. It's the part of the magic that you don't want to see because it'll kind of ruin the trick for you. And, it can be used in many ways. Uh, an example of bad kayfabe would be, you know, if I beat up freaking, uh, you know, John Wilkie, and then after the show, John Wilkie and I are at Denny's sharing a pie, and you know, and have like two straws and one smoothie. That's not a good look for the fans that might have seen us beat each other up at the show. Well, you can't speak about kayfabe. You know, kayfabe's kayfabe. You know, that's much I'm gonna give you about kayfabe. You keep it kayfabe. You know, what I'm doing right now is I'm keeping it kayfabe. Well, if you don't know what kayfabe is, then we're doing our job right. A work is wrestling. A work, say, oh my God, that guy must have really beaten him up. No, dude, we're driving home together. It's a work. <laughs> you know, like, it was so funny back in the day when people, you know, before the fans caught on to wrestling, when Iron Sheik and Hacksaw Jim Duggan were driving in the same car. They get pulled over by, you know, some cops and they start really fighting, you know, and, you know, the cops go, oh my God, you know, they, they just got done beating each other's ass, you know, but wait a minute, why are they in the same car? So, it's a work. <laughs> it's the opposite of a shoot. You know, you, you guys are in there working. You guys are in there, you guys aren't in there to hurt each other. You guys are in there to put on a good show. So you guys are working with each other, not shooting on each other. Shoot, it's when you hold up your fingers like this and pretend you have a gun <laughs> and then you point it at your opponent just so they know you mean business. That was a good explanation <laughs> no, of shoot, good. right? Yeah. I'm gonna go with him. Yeah. I mean, that was good. Yeah, know. shoot, it's a real <clears throat> shoot. It's a real shoot. <laughs> Let's put your sports knowledge to the test with this next story by talking about the huddle. 
Taylor Lupetti tells us the history of the huddle and how much influence it has on sports today. Hi, I'm Taylor Lupetti, and I'm from The Spear. My name is Everett Smith, and I am a professor here at San Jose State University. Would you mind telling the story of how the huddle originated at Gallaudet University? Of course. So here's the history I remember. The huddle was created a long time ago. I believe it was somewhere in the 1890s, the mid-1890s. There was a man on the Gallaudet University football team in Washington, D.C. His name was Paul Hubbard. Paul was the captain of the team at the time. He noticed that every time he would call his team together in the middle of the game to discuss plays, the opposing team could see what they were signing because they were not hiding their hands. Because of this, the other team would come back to the field knowing exactly what their plays were. After noticing that this was happening for a while, Paul, as the quarterback of Gallaudet, realized that if he had his team standing in a circle, with their hands down, the opposing team would not be able to see their hands. And that's how the huddle came to be. It's funny to think the idea came from the deaf community and is now used on every football field. So how do you think the creation of the huddle has changed sports today? I think it has changed sports in a big way. The idea from the deaf community traveled to the hearing community as they copied the huddle and it spread. People today don't know that the huddle came from the deaf, but it's still so important because it represents teamwork and the players of the team standing together and supporting each other. It doesn't matter if you sign or speak. The huddle represents playing together in unity. Thank you so much, Everett. From the Spear, Taylor Lupet. After years of persistent training, the women's tennis team has made it to the NCAA tournament. The team reflected on their journey this season with Lindsey Boyd. Women's tennis has come a long way to qualify San Jose State for the NCAA tournament, quite literally. The players came from France, Belgium, Switzerland, Thailand, and the other side of the country, Maryland. They teamed up at San Jose State and are proud of their journey to the NCAA tournament. We're a real family. Everyone get along really well. and. It helps a lot in those uh, hard situations when we, have to, we fight for each other. Mm -hmm. The team has been through the ups and downs of the season together. Coach Skrupka says he has seen the team improve over the past four years. Look, you know, we, we made some marks for the first time when we went representing the WAC Conference in 2013, and we've had some, some good results in the past and playing some better teams on our schedule. I think that's helped us in the past also. The battle to place in the top of the Mountain West Conference wasn't easy, but the ladies are proud of their overall performance. Yeah, we were playing better and better every day, and I think on the final we played like really amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think now we're confident for the next match. Versailles native Marie Clocker was overwhelmed with the emotion at the thought of playing in the NCAA tournament before returning to France. It was hard for her to find words to describe her feelings in French. Mes émotions maintenant. <laughs> Uh, je suis contente, uh, ravie, et j'ai juste hâte de jouer Cal et de les battre. After the NCAA, Clocker hopes to play professionally in France. Meanwhile, her other teammates also have plans to return home. Miranda is majoring in psychology. She'll go back to her homeland, Belgium, and work with young junior players, both on the court and off the court. The team has yet to finish their season. They will face UC Berkeley in the first round of the NCAA Women's Tennis Competition this Saturday, May 13th at noon. With a spear, Lindsey Boyd. That's all we have for this episode and this semester. The show will return in the fall, but keep an eye on the spear during the summer. We'll continue to cover SJSU athletics over the break. And always remember to follow us on social media. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.